golden age of, of digital marketing has ended. I think that was kind of this 2001 to 2015 run that we had usually in the field. And the reasons, the big reasons behind that were that internet adoption was growing so fast all around the world in, in developed and developing nations that even big tech companies who you know, had their monopolies and needed to show Wall Street or before that their, their private venture investors, crazy growth, didn't really need to deviate all that much from their core value. Like Google didn't have to start competing with whatever, all the publishers in Australia, which has been a, a fun and exciting story to watch. By the way, uh, kudos to both uh, the Australian um, news organizations and the French for uh, getting Google to cave. That's, um, that is a hard thing to do. I don't think Americans are ready for that. Uh, same time, keyword data, referral data, cookie tracking made organic marketing efforts, you know, SEO, content, social, email, uh, really easy to justify because you could see all of the traffic that was coming to you and you could track it all. And, you know, there's, it was sort of this, this wonderful world. In most sectors, in addition to these two, there were only a few players who were savvy enough to invest wisely in digital. And this made a ton of room for independent operators like all of us, right? We could start up our own little thing and eventually become a big, powerful player in whatever form of marketing we wanted to because little guys could compete. But over the last five years, um, things, have, things have been very different, right? Google basically you know, killed all organic keyword referral data with, with not provided. Um, big tech across the board, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, uh, obfuscated and continues to obfuscate referral data. So you have this huge rise in dark traffic and, and we don't know where a lot of the traffic that comes to us comes from and how many times it's visited us and uh, cookie tracking is getting tougher and tougher and, and soon it's going away altogether. Uh, Google, in order to get more growth, started competing with more publishers and in industries, building their own products, putting those first. All those laggards, the people who didn't invest over the last first 15 years, they, they finally caught up, right? Even your, whatever, and, and the pandemic accelerated this, right? Even the least savvy HVAC contractor in you know, Michigan um, is now <laughs> online and trying to do online digital marketing. Uh, the social algorithms, right, are, have gone from, hey, you can share your content and like we'll send you traffic and engagement and if you build your... Uh, your source on us will will um, show your work to our users, to walled gardens that essentially prioritize uh, engagement over displaying things people have subscribed to, and you know, frankly, with big tech through monopoly power and and the government uh, the government lobbying that comes with that, we have these five tech giants that control eighty percent of all web traffic. Also, I just want to say I hate bullet points. Oh God, do I hate them. And I will try to have very few slides that look anything like this ever, but sometimes you just have to go through. So, all right, uh, what's next? Okay, I, I am of the opinion that trying to keep up with the menagerie of news, right, that hits whatever tech meme or hacker news or um, marketing Twitter every day is absolutely exhausting and overwhelming and a full-time job just by itself. But it is technically important, right? Like. You, you wanna learn things like, oh man, yeah, Google is answering more than half of all searches without a click. So when, you know, when a thousand people go to Google and search for something, fewer than 500 of those searches are ending with an actual search click on anything. And you know, uh, back in September, uh, Google made this big change in paid search accounts such that search term visibility was cut. And it's like, oh gosh, all right, I should read the SEER article about that. That's really important, especially if I'm in PPC or helping clients who are or working on campaigns. There's this new thing where um, uh, Google has been showing more and more, mm, let's say, non-relevant results at the top of uh, their searches, especially in the ad results, even when they know those shouldn't be um, showing up for the ads because it forces advertisers to bid on navigational searchers to prevent competitors from, from diluting results. And they get a big revenue boost from this too, right? Um, Google has this plan to kill all third-party cookies. This is sort of coming a little bit from pressure from Mozilla, Firefox, and, and Apple, right? Who are talking about killing third-party cookies. I don't know if you saw the, the news that like Facebook bought a bunch of um, old school ads in like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and stuff to, to give Apple a hard time about this. 
Anyway, but most of the reason this is happening is so that Google can look like they're being consumer friendly, right? Privacy centric for all of us, but they're still storing as much data as ever. Their, their whole plan is this thing called Flock, which is you know, somewhat fun name, but uh, federated lists of cohorts where they essentially gather up all this data about what we all browse. And then they're the only one with enough power to effectively serve the ad market. Really good if you're a you know, Google executive, really bad if you're anyone else on the planet. Uh, Facebook, right, is linking up WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and Instagram. I don't know if you're getting these messages uh, in Australia, but we certainly get them here in, in the US, right, where we like see, oh, you log into your Facebook Messenger, or your Instagram, or your WhatsApp, and then it's like, oh, it, all of this is linked now. This is not for our convenience. It is super non-convenient. It's to make antitrust regulators question whether how possible it is to break up Facebook in the event that they find that that's something they want to do. Right, and Facebook has been not even quiet about this. Um, uh, after that Cambridge Analytica scandal, of course, in 2016, uh, Facebook started pushing tons of us and engagement on their platform from newsfeed over to groups. The great thing about groups, if you are Facebook, is they are pretty much invisible. Like you cannot see them from outside unless you've joined them. And so researchers couldn't show how much terrible activity was happening on them. And of course, um, then, you know, we nearly had an insurrection uh, in the United States. Wouldn't that have been weird? What if we were talking from like the new United States of not America anymore? That would be, that's totally plausible. But um, thank God that did not happen. But in, in any case, right, Facebook groups happily uh, sort of hosted and amplified this content because it earns engagement and ad revenue and it creates platform addiction. Like uh, Facebook very much found that groups were great for getting people addicted to their platform, coming back again and again, engaging again and again. And look, it, it hid a lot of the scandal risk problems that Facebook had been having post 2016. So it's super convenient for them in a lot of ways. The crappy thing about it for us um, as marketers, and never mind citizens or people who care about other people, but, but citizens, right, is that, or, or marketers, is that in order to do this, they had to drop organic reach dramatically, right? So dropping organic reach means every post that we put up on our pages, uh, every fan or, or, or um, connection that we've made on Facebook is worth that much less. The, the average engagement do you remember when we were complaining about average engagement rates on Facebook dropping to like 2%? You know, this was like four or five years ago. Now it is 0.09%. 0, 0.0. I, I have a page with about 36,000 you know, followers or whatever on Facebook. And when I post something, sometimes if I'm lucky, I'll get 350 people <laughs> to engage, right? And this is great for Facebook because they don't want to give me free engagement, right? They want to keep people on Facebook they want people to join those groups that are more addictive, and they want me to pay if I want to reach the fans that I built up on that platform. This also is very convenient for Facebook because it means places like BuzzFeed or before them Farmville, right, who built up their audiences on the back of Facebook engagement can't do that anymore, which is great. Facebook's the only winner. Uh, if you, if you like Amazon instead as your tech giant, you can see that, that they are taking bigger and bigger cuts of revenue um, and dominating their search results with more and more ads. This helps discourage anyone else from using the profits they earn off of Amazon to build up any sort of substantive e-commerce platform. And this is part of the antitrust case against Amazon. And then they can leverage their market dominance to increase their own profit because I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, at least in the United States, a lot of Amazon uh, products five years ago, 10 years ago, certainly, that Amazon was the cheapest provider. But over the last three years, there have been a ton of studies from all sorts of places that Amazon is actually oftentimes the most expensive uh, in lots of categories where they dominate. Because once they dominate a category, they, go, they become very expensive knowing that none of us are going to go savvily search other places. And it's not just that, right? Amazon can learn what sells for how much, find the margins, and then cut out the middleman, right? Essentially, all, all the other sellers build their own products. And of course, there's uh, um, employees <laughs> of Amazon, in fact, had records of doing this, right? That uh, prevented transfer of power from Amazon to anyone else. And then they own the supply chain. So 
look, I, right, I'm walking through all of these things and trying to explain them all. And my God, if you, if you feel overwhelmed, you're not alone. I, I feel completely overwhelmed trying to keep up with this stuff. I think it is ludicrous the degree to which all of this impacts our day-to-day -day marketing and the advice and recommendations that we might give to teams or clients or friends or people in our world or how I do my marketing for my startup, but it's impossible to stay ahead of this, right? This is just not, not realistic. So I think the way to go about this is with something that, that, I don't know, fancy intellectual people who are not me call systems thinking. We try and understand root causes of the environment so that we can optimize strategy for the long term and tactics too. So I, I, I found it really helpful when, when like looking into this to think about it visually. And there was a great, great visual that tries to show it. So there's basically all these disconnected elements. You know, Google does this, Amazon does that, Facebook does that. And then you can synthesize those, right? You can connect all those dots and try and figure out what are the root causes behind all of them. You can analyze each one of these and how it affects you, or you can try and have some synthesis around how the whole long-term picture is going to affect everything that you do so that as you make investments, you can reliably know that the ones that you're making suit the situation for a long period of time and you don't need to revisit every time, you know, your tactics, every time there's a new announcement on whatever Amazon's up to. Now, in order to do this <laughs> systems thinking, we need, <laughs> this is, does this sound slightly ambitious to squish 70 me, years of? Rand, do you want me to put you on 1.8 speed or something here? Oh, no, God, my, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that folks are already like, are you kidding me? You're going to go through economic history. I promise. I'm going to try and make it not boring. This is this is going to be the biggest challenge of my life is to make 70 years of economic history not boring. But let me, I'll give it a stab. Um, okay. In the beginning, uh, <laughs> so essentially, what what I'm what I'm going to try and show you is like why do wealthy people and companies, which essentially control most of our our internet life prefer growth over profit, how did that come to be? And what does that mean for the long-term? And then I'll dive into to the, the, the learnings that come out of that. And I'll show a, little, a couple of tactics right at the end. So I'm gonna take you back to 1950. There's this great piece on the New York Times. Uh, Aki, if you, wanna, if you wanna provide links to people, it's fun to play with, right? Cause you can essentially go back to a time when US taxation was very progressive, right? So like the more you made, the more you paid, which seems reasonable to people in 1950, but, but not, not, not today, right? Uh, and wealthy families and corporations like use their money and influence to bring their taxes down, even as their profits soared. And of course, they sort of had the fastest income growth. We've all seen charts like this that are like, oh yeah, you know, wealthy Americans. And I don't have the data for this worldwide, but you can pretty much assume this is true in most of Western capitalist countries. Um, at the same time, you get this massive gap emerging between productivity and pay, right? So, um, you know, productivity pre uh, 1980 and post, like it kept track with compensation. Basically, the harder all of us worked, the more we made. And then post kind of these tax changes, that, that stops happening. Like those two are disconnected. We work harder and harder, making more and more sort of value for the economies we're part of, and we get compensated dramatically less for that, which also leads to a big gap between rich and poor, because those profits go somewhere, they just end up going to wealthy people, which is why um, you can see that, you know, uh, the, the Gilded Age right before the, the Great Depression uh, in the 1920s, and today income inequality looks really similar and sort of scary. And over the last 40 years, those tax lobbying efforts I talked about, super effective. Here's that same New York Times chart for 2018 when <laughs> the wealthiest 400 people in the United States paid far less um, than the person who, do you have Taco Bell? I mean, you should be thankful if you don't. It's like a really good thing for you. No Taco health. Bell. Just No Taco to, Bell. Yeah, some other. Okay, but you have Hungry Jacks, right? Yes, yes. I still call it Burger King, though. But I mean, oh, I mean, 
I find it, I can't tell you how delightful it is for Americans when they come to Australia and are like, Hungry Jacks, they stole the Burger King logo. Oh my God, <laughs> what about the copyright? And it's like, no, no, there was one Aussie guy in like 1955 who was really smart and he bought it for all time. Uh, but in any case, your Hungry Jacks Burger King employee paying much more taxes than the 400 wealthiest Americans. How does this happen? And why do we care? I'm getting to both those. The way, the biggest way this happens right now is via this, this green, I know this chart is a nightmare, but this, uh, the green realized capital gains area, this one right here, that shows that basically the tax incentive shift. And so wealthy Americans shift the way they make money in order to not pay as much taxes, right? Tax code incentives, oh my God, do they work? They're so effective, super, super effective. And in tech, which sort of dominates all of our attention, right? Investors in, exploit this capital gains loophole. So a loophole that's, that's only grown. You can see that, you know, in the start of the 2000s, it was like 15% tax rate. Did you know, like, if Aki and I want to invest in some tech company like five years ago, and let's say we put $50,000 in, into a tech company, and then it sold last week, and we made uh, nine and a half million dollars off of that. Do you know how much taxes we would pay? Zero, not one dollar in taxes would we pay on that investment. We just made whatever, $9.5 million, we would pay nothing, not a penny on that. And that, that is because, right, of how these, uh, these tax structures work. Funny story about this, venture capital, which powered Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, LinkedIn, every tech company you can name, right? All of those venture backed companies um, are, are basically backed by this investment class that does not perform very well, but because of the tax incentives around it, it functions, like it, it manages to function. And the reason it functions is because those companies, just like investors in the public markets, they don't want this. They don't want companies like, you know, like most of the ones we work at. I don't know exactly where everybody works, but most of the companies we work at make profits. And then like we use our profits to pay ourselves. And if we have more profits, that's great. Tech companies hate profits. They despise them. They're terrible. They're useless. They don't want them. Profits suck. What you want at a tech company is growth. You want growth because growth is how you pay no taxes. Growth is how you basically have shares that are valued at one thing and then you sell them for a higher price later. That's why you get this mentality of unicorns being more valuable than everything else. Okay, my five minutes are up. How does this actually affect web landscape, digital marketing, there's, there's like this disconnect. Here's all these dots, right? And, and I need to show the connectedness between this. So tax code incentives and sort of wealthy lobbying and income inequality and, and uh, tax loopholes and, and venture capital, these are all connected to why the tech world works the way it does. And that is essentially, right? You have these companies that are backed by investors spending lots of money on unprofitable growth and driving up ad prices. If you've ever tried to compete, for example, in like the office space world against WeWork, you know that WeWork will spend whatever, you know, $5,000 per new customer they acquire, even though they don't make $3,000 on that person. What are they doing? They're, they're, it's unprofitable growth. It doesn't make any sense, but, but it does. This leads, of course, to company leadership valuing growth over everything else. And, and big tech is sort of pulling all this data away and competing with their own customers once they have market power because they are also seeking growth rate, right? Investors playing these same games, big, data, big tech uh, providing tracking data for paid channels but not organic, right? Paid acquisition is very provable and valuable. So you, it gets more investment, all, all these things are like my dots. They're my dots in my analysis, my, my uh, you know, lack of connections. And the things behind these, it's really just two. It's just the incentives of the ownership and the algorithms that power them. If you get these two things, if you understand these two things, 
you can do exactly what we need to do, stay one step ahead without having to play these, this, this whack-a-mole keep it up game, right? So rather than try and play analysis one by one, we can play synthesis and be proactive. We can accurately predict like what's big tech gonna do? What are these chain, which, which direction is Google and Facebook and Microsoft and, and Amazon and Reddit and all these platforms, which way are they going and why? So let's, let's dive into that. Let's play with some algorithms and incentives. So first off, uh, this is data from SimilarWeb, which I like a lot. SimilarWeb has a great free platform. Whew. This, this is a, I love this new sweater I got, but it is quite warm. This is, this is a warm cardigan that is now going to be discarded. Please do not tweet about how Rand is undressing on the webinar. That is not something that, I well, probably if you do, Geraldine will run into my little shed here, my wife, and then that, that could be fun. But um, I would have put on some fancy music as you took that off. Right? <laughs> <I wouldn't. laughs> it's inappropriate, Dan. How could you possibly? <laughs> um, uh, but but so right, big tech is is so dominant that the top one percent of of all websites, right, that are sort of like uh, in this get get about ninety eight percent of the traffic. Now this is one percent of the eight thousand ish most popular websites, but still, we are getting this because these te big tech companies are incentivized for growth and they are optimizing their algorithms for engagement to get them that growth. So this is, this is how these work, right? Here's my Twitter feed. This is from today, earlier today. Uh, so my friend, Andrew, he, his is the first tweet in here. It has one like on it, right? Do you remember a time when like Twitter and, and Facebook and Reddit and all these places, like they'd show you the stuff that got a lot of amplification, but now, this is the thing that Twitter, based on my behavior in the past, thinks is most likely to keep me engaged on Twitter's platform. And Ross's tweet is the thing that they think is second most likely. And this is the third most likely thing, right, from, from Michelle, only 15 seconds ago from Michelle. Behind the scenes, what's going on here is machine learning, right? The machine learning system, the algorithm that powers this is essentially, you know, historically it was like signal A, signal B, signal C. Right? So whatever, your, your Google ranking engineers, let's say maybe, I don't know, um, Danny and David and I were all like Google engineers, we'd sit at a table, we'd be like, well, I think we should weight keywords higher. Yeah, well, I think we should rate links higher. And then we'd like, you know, we'd sort it out, we'd see which one we liked. Now, the machine does this for us, right? We just have to figure out, we just tell the machine, find some method of weighting all the signals you can to align with the best possible outcome. Right, so then, then you get some score like, okay, X percent of A plus Y percent of B plus Z percent of C equals our new ranking algorithm. That's how we're gonna determine which tweets to show Rand and everybody else, right? Or which Google search results to show, all, all this kind of thing. In years past, like I spent the first 20 years of my career at Moz trying to figure out what the ranking signals were. And now I don't have to worry about it. I, I mean, maybe some people still care and they're like really interested in what Google's using and not. And, and guess what? Even Google engineers don't really know what Google's using because that's how deep learning systems work. Today, what we really need to know is the outcome, the outcome everyone's optimizing toward. That is what matters, right? That, because that is where we can stay ahead of the algorithm. So what are the machine learning systems incentives, right? If I, if I go to Twitter, what is Twitter trying to do? Oh my God, Fox News dunking is one of my favorite things about Twitter. And obviously Twitter knows this and also it's easy to do. Um, and so, right, the first thing that Twitter is trying to do, Twitter's algorithm is trying to do, is show content that's gonna earn engagement from me. They want me to keep scrolling, keep clicking, whatever the heart or the reply or the like or, or the, the uh, retweet or quote tweet or whatever it is, right? Follow more people, engage with more stuff, stay, stay on there. They want me uh, on Twitter, not clicking over to places. And so they're much more likely to, excuse me, show me a tweet with a screenshot of Fox News and a mention of their Twitter handle, but not a link to their website, right? Because that keeps me on Twitter. It makes it hard for me to go off of there. 
and they want to gather as much data about me and what I like as possible, both to improve my engagement algorithm and to show me better ads. Reddit works the same way. So does Instagram. So does Facebook. So does YouTube. So do LinkedIn. All of them use the same system. Google News and, and Google Discover, if you're on an Android device, right? Google Discover works the same way. Google News, per, personalized by default now. They show you things they think you'll engage with that'll make you come back. Google Search uses an algorithm with a similar incentive structure. If I search for a rice donabe, by the way, has it, any of you, I guess I can't see you all, but assuming I'm going to pretend that you're all raising your hand because you, like me, have become obsessed with Japanese cooking during quarantine. Ah, shit, wait a minute. You're not in quarantine, are you? We've been in quarantine for a year. All right, well, never mind. Just going to pretend. Some are, fast some forward. Are, some are, some, but we all need Japanese cooking tips, Ran. Yes, yes, exactly, right? Like, you want to make amazing, fluffy, perfectly sticky Japanese rice for your oyakodan or, or your kareage or whatever it is you're making. So, okay, last night I made ginger pork, so good, so amazing. So I got a Donabe, it did cost me like $200, but I was very excited about it and we're saving tons of money by not being able to do anything for a year. So, so Google search, what is Google search doing here, right? They are showing me justonecookbook.com because that is the result Google thinks is most likely to satisfy my query. It's not necessarily the best keywords, the best optimized, um, it's not necessarily the result with the most links to it or the most anchor text or whatever it is, right? It's the one Google thinks is most likely to satisfy my search query. This is the second most likely and then the third most likely, et cetera, et cetera. Say, just like how social media uh, machine learning systems work. You don't have to know all the ranking inputs. You don't have to know whether Google uses, I don't know, brand entity tracking across social sites or not, or whether tweets are a signal or, or they aren't, doesn't matter, don't care, right? I just want to know what drives searchers to prefer one result over another. Because if I can, if I can effectively do that, I will win no matter where Google's algorithm goes. So that's things like brand and relevance and trustworthiness and comprehensiveness and accuracy and quality all the things that Google puts in their search quality rater guidelines, which they say their algorithm doesn't measure directly, but they can get indirectly. No, no surprise that these systems have overtaken all of us, right? The incentives for Google, the incentives for the social sites, for all of these platforms are growth and engagement. Get us coming back, spending more time, spending more on them. So if you are trying to optimize for Google search, you care a lot less about specific ranking factors and a lot more about results that best satisfy searchers' queries. If you're optimizing for social amplification, you care uh, 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 much less about you know, hashtags and memes and what have you, and much more about engaging posts that earn that amplification and keep users on the network. And if you're trying to do well in YouTube or Google News or Google Discover, uh, you want content that keeps people all coming back to that platform. And you don't need to pay attention all that much to like the salacious visuals and the clickbait and the tactical content tricks that a few years ago were sort of everything in digital marketing. This is also true for advertising algorithms with, with a little bit, a slightly different incentive model. And so a little bit different um, in terms of how it works, but essentially, Here's, you can <laughs> you can tell I have been clothing shopping also during quarantine. Apparently, I need new clothes to fit my rice donabe built body. Mm. Body by rice? I don't know. There's something there. Uh, I'm I'm gonna workshop this for the next time I have to tell jokes over Zoom. They go over terribly. Um, they're really surprisingly challenging to be charming over video. Uh, so. What is happening here? Is Adidas the highest bidder? No, they're not. But they're the ad Google Display Network thinks is the most likely to succeed with me. And that's part of, partly because I was actually looking at those sneakers. Not that anyone sees anyone's sneakers anymore. So like, what does that matter? But eventually I assume, you know, we'll get vaccinated and be able to travel. And if you're in Australia, it matters still. So that's nice. Um, not the most broadly engaging ad. But this is Instagram showing me the one with the best combination of revenue for, for them, right? 
continued use and personalized behavior, right? And searcher satisfaction is something that Google is not generally willing, and, and Facebook too, right, are not generally willing to sacrifice just for ad revenue because they want people to be engaged and happy. And so this advertiser, right, uh, which is Logitech here at the top, this advertiser likely gets the most clicks and pays the least per click, right? And, and as you go down the list, fo the folks from Jabra are probably paying more money and getting less clicks. And that is because of how ad quality scoring works, right? They want that high engagement. So the tighter your ad targeting, the, the, the more you concentrate on the people who really are likely to whatever, buy your shirt or your video camera, and the greater your relevance to them, the better your ad quality scores get, the lower prices you pay, the more uh, high quality clicks that you get, and, and so your cost of customer acquisition declines. So if you're Owl Labs, right, you probably want to narrow in on exactly the audience that's right for you, as opposed to trying to just outbid everybody, unless you're venture-backed, in which case you should try and outbid everybody. All right, so let's just talk about what this means for marketing strategy, and I'll wrap up with these last three points. If you're gonna make marketing a competitive advantage in 2021, beyond, you, you basically need to do these three things, right? One, you need to have a brand that people know, like, trust, and prefer over alternatives. This, this is going to give you the maximum advantage in whatever it is, growing your social presence or doing well on content networks or drawing in clicks from Google search or getting more people to buy from you and convert when they're given options. So I, you know, I, I mentioned that I've been cooking a lot. It's not just rice. I also, oh man, I've been buying all the specialized equipment. Apparently this is a presentation about my kitchen habits. Um, so here I am, right? I, I search for how to make the best pesto. I really wanna make great pesto. Great piece from Serious Seats. And there's, you see that, that fancy mortar? It's giant, by the way. It's like this giant, heavy Italian mortar and pestle. So this is my first time seeing it. And I was like, huh, that thing looks impressive. Mean, do I need one of those in order to make great pesto? Do I need like this big Italian marble thing? And I'm reading Kitchen Detail and they mention, oh yeah, look at that. Look at that, that this is it's a real pesto calls for a rather substantial white marble mortar with a serious wood pestle. We used to import them at La Cuisine from the prized Baudoni family firm, Nuova Marmotecnica. Nuova Marmotecnica, huh, all right, Nuova Marmotecnica. So I'm visiting, you know, all these Italian cooking sites. This is like brand impression number 50. And look at that, there it is again. That little bugger, he's following me around the internet and it's not even a targeted ad. It's just like all these Italian cooking sites are talking about Nuova Marmotecnica mortar and pestle. Fine, I will pay $220 for expedited shipping on your <laughs> pesto rock and stick. And yes, um, I do have one. There, there is me trying to make pesto in this giant device. It is a lot of hard work. Oh my God, you will sweat so hard trying to make pesto in this thing, um, but it's worth it. It makes amazing pesto. It's awesome, right? So the strategy here is I got to figure out who my customers are, find the messages that are going to resonate with them. In this case, you know, recommend pesto rock and stick to me. It's going to work find the sources that influence them, right? Eater, and I, I, I went to like the um, James Beard Foundation, all these places, right? And discover where those audiences engage. In, in my case, it's a lot of Instagram and Twitter. Amplify messages that work in the places they pay attention. Ta-da, oh man, this is like, this is a little marketing 101 right here. I, but, but I do have a hot tip for you. Um, so the, the company I work at, the, the company that, that I founded is SparkToro, and this is sort of what it does, right? If my audience is people, are people who talk about Italian food or use the hashtag Italian food on their Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest and what have you, these are their sources of influence, right? 10% of them are following Nigella Lawson, who I will admit in the early 2000s, I had a big crush on her when she was on the Food Network. Um, all right, number two. We've got to invest in a diversity of marketing channels so we don't get overly reliant on just one. Because paid acquisition through ads is a lot like pushing a big boulder up a hill, right? Every incremental ad impression, 
and the customer conversion that hopefully comes with it costs you, you know, dollars. Like, and, and you're not getting efficiency over time because as you get better, so too does your competition. And when Facebook or Google have to show Wall Street more growth, you're going to pay more, right? This, this is just boulder pushing. Like every step of progress requires the same amount of effort. Instead, what you want to do is diversify your marketing and start with organic, then go to paid so that you've built up that brand recognition, that brand preference first, and then invest in digital advertising and, and paid search and those kinds of channels, which perform much better once people know you, like you, trust you. Also, whatever you do, don't build your digital home on rented land, right? So like, I think it's great. Like I, I use all of these channels, right? All the ones we talked about today and a bunch more. I have presences on all of these. I, I don't spend as much effort on like Instagram because that's not where my eyes is. I do spend a lot of effort on LinkedIn and Twitter. That's where my audience is. But I drive it all back to my website and email list because I saw right five years ago when all my Facebook fans became next to useless when Facebook dropped the reach numbers. And I... I'm just not willing to go through that again with, you know, whatever the new hotness is with Substack or what have you. All right, uh, email opens. Money, like 250 times higher than Facebook uh, page engagement. And these email rates from, benchmark, from, from uh, MailChimp's benchmarks, they have been steady for 20 years. Email is a channel that has not fluctuated the way the other ones are. And emails really do convert. Like they work beautifully. They've especially worked wonderfully in um, over the last year during the coronavirus. There you go. All right, my last slide here. Build, you wanna build a marketing flywheel that scales with decreasing friction. No matter what sort of investments you're making, flywheels are gonna give you a creative, a competitive advantage. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean um, briefly, right? The, rather than boulder pushing, you want a flywheel that starts with something like, as an example, I do a marketing thing, right? I uh, run a webinar with Dan. Uh, Dan and Aki and I do a webinar together and hopefully boost that thing's reach, right? Uh, Dan republishes this later and uh, the maybe the webinar goes on YouTube and goes on uh, the Future of Now's website and it gets amplified there. And that brings more people to my audience and my email list. And so now next time, uh, I have amplification or next time I'm doing the thing that I'm the, the marketing thing, my algorithmic signals are better because all the networks are sort of like, oh yeah, people seem to really like this thing Rand's doing. And, and I get higher ROI next time I do it. And, so, and then I do it again, right? And hopefully the idea is that even though this is a hard thing to get going, it scales with decreasing friction over time. And that's how I build up a real competitive advantage.